Hey, it's another Tuesday and it's a design tool Tuesday as per usual, or as every now and then, you know, I sometimes skip them, but forgive me. Today, I want to share with you a simple framework and a tool which I've been using in my IC days, but also in my management paths and coaching and everything in between. It's UX factor, which influence how you plan, how you test, how you do UX. And it's, I think, from 2004 by Peter Morwell, which is called as Honeycomb of User Experience. It's actually a perfect framework to kind of use as a starter to understand exactly what you could do to improve a user experience. But to explain the actual framework, the user experience or your product has to be useful. For example, if from a practical sense or beneficial sense, if it doesn't add enough value to the user and it doesn't provide them with an ability to complete their task or to achieve their goals, when, then that product doesn't really provide good UX. It has to be useful for someone who actually owns that piece of experience. It could be that you're just an app user. It could be that you're a service user and you're going through a lot of different digital or physical touch points. It has to provide you enough of use so that you can achieve your goals and it answers your user needs. And that's really important. It's almost like a foundational uh, segment or a honeycomb piece, which we can then reflect and say, hmm, well, this existing product or service maybe is not so useful. What could I do to make it more useful and track the delta and create hypotheses and then make that redesign? And now the next one is usable and it's the main, I think, factor which we as UX designers keep considering. And, you know, we sometimes say, oh, I redesigned this app because I wanted to improve the usability. It's exactly what this is coming from. It's really providing with the ability for the users to, again, fulfill their tasks or their goals or their jobs, you know, to be done or to complete the jobs to be done with the usability in mind. So it's efficient, it's effective, they can complete their tasks and goals again without no major friction points. And if you kind of zoom out and look at the reality of it, like there is plenty of products which are just clunky and give you immediate example, this adapter for a cable to get into my Mac, you know, from USB A to USB C, you could argue, hey, we just get a better cable. But the product itself as an adapter was created to ease the use somewhat but it's still too clunky, it still could be improved, it still could become much more usable. It's useful, right? And it's successful, it obviously sold, they paid those, you know, 20 quid or something for it, but it could kind of improve in various stages of how usable your products get. And so you as a designer can kind of reflect and say, hey, maybe it's at that kind of like a good enough state, how can I make it just a bit better and more useful in the end? And now the next one is findable. What you have to do is really to ensure that your product and content in it are easy to find. The affordances and what exactly the user is able to do with the product should be very clear and at a glance. And let's say if they want to find something specific, like, hey, I would like to remove my account, they should know where approximately it should be. And as we kind of go through the journey and remove flows, we should uncover that specific task so we can find what we seek. And this is super important because to design for that, you then need to be able to understand and, and deeply understand the user needs and the jobs they're trying to complete. Like all the, their goals and expectations and how quickly they need and even the priorities, the mental models comes into place because not every person wants to find the specific information and other people might need something else. And as a designer, you need to focus on increasing the clarity of those affordances. You need to enhance the information architecture, obviously, and enhance it so it makes sense for that particular user. That's why you do user testing, let's say, so you understand how natural the journeys are. Whatever your product is, navigation is king. The customer should be able to adopt your navigation instantly. 
And now the next one is credibility. And it stems from the actual brand perception, but also, you know, what other people say. It stems from a lot of different signals around it. It's not just about the product itself, but of course, there is a lot of factors to it too, especially if it's a novel product, that's how people would perceive it and kind of accurately gauge of the experience and what sort of user experience it could entail before they even engage. There are so many different signals around it. It could be, again, recognition of a brand. It could be the past experiences you had with similar products or the look and feel of it. Let's say if, you know, your actual product you design just doesn't look that great or looks dated, you naturally would assume that the experience you're going to have with it is going to be also dated, not going to have all the bells and whistles you would expect from the product, which would again, fulfill those needs. And as such, you wouldn't even engage with it. Your experience would likely end there. You might pick up something else out there if let's say it's as affordable or other factors considered where the value of a product clearly overlaps with what you need from it. And as a designer, if let's say you would pick up a product like that, which needs to improve the credibility, you kind of can zoom out and say, okay, we need to improve the expectations of the actual product. We need to improve the trust and build the trust. It could be copy-based, content-based, messaging and so forth. It could be that you need to engage with the user much earlier in different meets and use other channels like customer experience channels, like let's say email campaigns or kind of, you know, drip feed and try to hook people in so they can understand that, hey, your product is not that bad, which let's say a lot of the brands have been doing lately and where you see, let's say, oil giants adding ads and a lot of different TV campaigns. And some of it is rightful, some of it is greenwashing, obviously, but there was a big effect of creation of credible experiences so that people who are using the product from, let's say, one of the oil manufacturers, they could actually trust it enough because there is some sort of care perception from the actual brand. And of course, the last one, which adds to the credibility and designing the product is giving ownership to the actual user because nobody's gonna trust the product if they don't have enough control of that product and this is super applicable for SaaS experiences let's say where very small cost of entry where let's say you might sign up for something like 10 pounds or 10 dollars a month subscription and you can cancel it anytime therefore it has to be credible enough for you to submit even that small kind of frictionless point of entry which end, ends up obviously being thousands down the road but you don't know about that but credibility from a brand from the actual product is going to matter for you to even start and sign up and now the next one is accessibility and accessible experiences are paramount. Like every product you design are going to become more and more restricted by the compliance where you're going to have to be open and supportive of all the different abilities out there. They have again permanent or temporary or situational disabilities of sorts. It could be visual impairment. It could be that we have just a migraine and you need to support those users because again, it could be safety concerns, commercial concerns, it could be quite lethal in different scenarios if you design something like hardware. So a lot of different things to consider depending on what segment you represent or what industry you're a part of, but accessible experiences are good user experiences. You absolutely need to serve the users of all abilities doesn't matter where we come from what their background is again it's deeply inclusive approach to it and this really should be changed in this day and age as inclusive experiences because accessibility is kind of part of that but as a designer obvious takes is to consider more to test more to include different user types to basically reflect exactly how easy and accessible your products are it's to start but also use and also exit and kind of throughout that life cycle journey shaping the product so that it's inclusive and the next factor is desirable 
And actually, that's how a lot of the designers start with UX, because they think from that desirability standpoint. They see a product they might like, let's say they love it, they love to use it, and they think, oh, I would love to do this for a living. I would love to get paid to do this as a hobby, as a paid hobby, and maybe get invested in it and learn and break into the field and start designing experiences for others, usually where it starts. And as you know, people think with their eyes and hearing and every other sense to follow, but they perceive things and they perceive the value, they perceive the experience it's going to entail. They project what sort of value it's going to deliver to them. So desirability is massive here. The look and feel, the brand identity, the emotional design and persuasive design are paramount here. As you as a designer then need to consider what's competitive and not competitive. What is going to excel your product from all this different landscape of a lot of different other products and services and brands. Doesn't matter what you do in this day and age, all the low hanging fruits are already picked. So you need to realize exactly what makes your brand excel just a little bit more and then your user to pick that brand and use it. I would just advise you to, again, invest in look and feel. Again, not every UXer has to be visual maestro of sorts and you don't have to be a graphic designer, you know, expert at that. It's not just about that, but there is a fraction of it. It could be that you're going to join a team which has a lot of uh, product design expertise. It could be that you're going to do more information architecture work or UX strategy or maybe research, but there has to be that appreciation for visual design or that desirability aspect when you craft the products themselves. Well, a last one is value, which is that central piece. You could take every single segment and tie into a value. But value to me is all about value fit. If let's say other six factors are completed and tick the box for the user, so they're useful, they're usable, they're findable, they're credible, they're desirable, they're accessible, that then would create a value chain of sorts. And let's say if the cost is reasonably priced, which should be strategically assessed, users can then mentally compare those factors, or at least they do to some extent, and then they gauge and say, hey, is this balanced or not? And if the value and the cost roughly equals, or in their perception equals, that then what creates that valuable experience which we opt in. If you lack on any of these segments, chances are it kind of draws you back and as such, the competition is going to be rougher for you. But if you optimize those factors or you use them to optimize your experiences, you are much more likely to nail it. And now let me tell you how I used this framework in the past. I used it very simply to evaluate experiences. I also used this to drive the UX outcomes, because if you can create a table which covers these segments and say, this is what's lacking in the current project, and this is what you could be doing in the next iteration, maybe this is your hypothesis. And as such, let's say if you work with a client or with a stakeholder, you can say that, okay, these are the seven things we must improve, and this is how we're gonna measure each of the improvements. They might overlap on a measure sense, but it's gonna make you much more structured in your approach, but also much more sensible from the stakeholder perspective. So I would advise you to kind of zoom out and use more of these frameworks when you talk about the actual improvements instead of just saying, oh, we just need to make it more usable. Because there's just so many more factors which would make your messaging much more weighty, much more rightful, because you're gonna make better choices and hopefully make better user experiences. If you enjoy this video, leave a comment down below. And on that note, I'll see you next time.